Hello and welcome to today's webinar on organic grass-fed dairy production by Heather Darby and Sarah Ziegler of the University of Vermont and Sarah Flack of Sarah Flack Consulting. This is the first webinar in a series of three taking place this month and next about different topics related to a USDA NIFA funded research project about organic grass-fed dairy. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and before we start, I just wanted to let you know that we have many articles and recorded webinars on organic dairy farming and research on our website at eorganic.org and on our YouTube channel. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome back Heather Darby, Sarah Flack, and Sarah Ziegler. Heather Darby is an agronomist at the University of Vermont, where she conducts applied research and outreach on farm-based fuel, forage, and grain production systems in New England. Sarah Ziegler is the Crops and Soils Coordinator of the Northwest Crops and Soils Program, where she works on a grass-fed dairy project and annual livestock forage trials and other projects. And Sarah Flack is a national consultant on grass-based livestock farming based in Fairfield, Vermont. So with that, I'm going to hand over the remote control to our first presenter, Heather Darby. So Heather, if you just click on the screen once, you should have control. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or I guess maybe morning, depending on, on where you um, are located. And thanks for attending our webinar today. We're going to be talking about the research that we've been conducting through a USDA OREI project, the one that Alice already mentioned. Um, and today we're going to be talking about organic grass-fed dairy demographics, management, and cost of production research that we've been doing here at the University of Vermont. All right, so let's first just define 100% grass-fed organic milk, uh, just so we're all on the same page with what we're calling um, grass-fed organic. So grass-fed milk comes from dairy animals that are fed a diet without grain in their ration. The ration is instead a mixture of different types of forages, not just grass, including legumes, grasses, and other forbs such as chicory, plantain, and dandelion. Um, additional supplementation with minerals is generally needed and also um, approved in this system. Okay, so the grass organic dairy grass fed standards are a little bit different than the organic dairy standards. And I just wanted to show you a, a little glimpse of that so you can see um, <clears throat> the bigger differences here. So the grazing season minimum is 150 days. The pasture intake during that time must average 60%. There's no grain or grain byproducts that are allowed. And of course, we have to have really um, pay really close attention to animal care, welfare, and nutrition because we're limiting what can be fed on that farm. And then there's additional standards, uh, especially for milk processing, so that the segregation of milk can be maintained and there's any um, no cases of or potential for co-mingling. Uh, as of today, there are these set standards and there's third party certification, which is very similar to organic dairy, annual application and on-farm inspections, but there are third party vendors that offer that. There are several different certifiers now that have a grass-fed add-on. So again, the project that our team had funded through the USDA Organic Research and Extension Initiative was called Advancing Grass-Fed Dairy, a whole systems approach to enhancing productivity, quality, and farm viability in the US. And this project was funded in 2018. So we are in our, um, going into our fourth year of the project and we have a, a good, list, a long list of collaborators that have been working on the project with us. Uh, many of these names you probably recognize that have been collaborating on organic dairy projects for years, um, but just a list of our various collaborators. The objective of our project were quite a few. <laughs> we wanted to understand the economic and production metrics for grass-fed dairy systems 
through implementing various benchmarking systems on farms throughout the US. And we're gonna be talking about that today at this webinar. We also wanted to understand nutrient cycling dynamics and the subsequent impact on crop, soil, and animal production and health. Again, because these farms are limited in what they can feed um, and the fact that they're not bringing grain onto the farm means that there's different nutrient cycling dynamics. Our objective three was to investigate the impact of soil and forage management on nutrient cycling, forage production, forage quality, and farm economics. And we will be having a webinar um, with Andre Brito and Miriam Snyder and Plevs. Now I apologize, I can't remember his last name. He's working with Andre at UNH. He's a postdoctorate researcher there. They'll be having a webinar in March. And then we also had an exciting addition to our project where we were looking at consumer demands, market demands for grass-fed milk and looking at the sensory qualities of the milk. And we will be hosting a, a webinar with Roy DeRochiers from UVM on March 22nd. And then of course, sharing all this information with the farmers that we work with and other technical service providers and stakeholders. So I wanted to kick off the webinar talking about the national survey that we conducted um, at the start of the project and some of the results from that survey. This information has been published and I'll show you the link to that in the presentation. Um, but we really wanted to start the project off by understanding the needs um, and the demographics. We knew very little about grass-fed dairy farms, what they looked like um, in the Northeast, the Midwest, the West, the South. Uh, what were these farms composed of? How many animals? How many acres? Uh, you know, similar information that we like to gather so that we can understand, understand the client, right? Um, and then start to try to unearth some of the needs of the grass-fed dairy industry. So the national survey again was to assess various aspects, you know, sort of a 50,000 foot view of what grass-fed dairy farms look like across the United States. And there's a link down here um, to the publication that was just recently published last year. So you can get more, more details. All right, so just a little bit about the materials and methods. It was a tailored design method. Um, that the survey went out in the late spring, early summer of 2019. There were three sections about you and your farm, about your herd, and about your forage grazing, um, about your forage grazing and some other management pieces. We had 350, we contacted 351 farms, and then we um, sent a follow up postcard if we did not receive a response with our initial survey. We had a good response rate. We had 167 respondents, so 46.8% of the total. So of the farms that responded, here are the top five states that the respondents were from, um, New York, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. And this is you know, well aligned, of course, with some of the um, of, of the states that also have high numbers of organic dairies to begin with. Also, I would say that, you know, some, some of the respondent rate, again, had to really do with, you know, the best advertising we could do or the proximity um, to some of our collaborators, et cetera. But overall, we still got good, what we thought was good representation um, of grass-fed dairy across the country. All right, now interestingly, 61 of our respondents to the survey identified as part of the Plain community, um, which is Amish or Mennonite. So most of our respondents came from the Plain community and 39% were outside of that community. The average age of the respondent was 47.6 years old, so a little bit younger than kind of the national average um, age of dairy farmer, and 91.4% were male. 84.2% of those that responded had been grass-fed for about 5.1 years, and 96% of all the people that responded had been organic for over 10 years. 
All right, so a little bit about the findings. You know, we did ask a lot of questions about the grazing system and their grazing season ranged from 140 days to 360 days, depending on where they were across the country. Um, and the average grazing period was 197 days. So if you remember from my previous slide, the requirement is 150 days. So on average, people were exceeding the requirement for grazing. And most farmers were using management intensive grazing and they were moving their animals twice or more times a day, which makes sense. These farms are relying on forage only. So forage uh, pasture management was um, of significant importance. Now, we saw that 90 to 100% of the producers um, or I'm sorry, 38.9% of the producers were getting 90 to 100% of their intake from pasture during the grazing season. So um, clearly, you know, farmers were utilizing that pasture quite extensively as they should be given that these are farms that really can only feed forage. Um, let's see, most of the farms had uh, crossbreed herds, 54% of the herds were crossbred, the 22% um, were Holstein, and you can see the further breakdown, but most of the farms were um, milking crossbreds. On average, there were 49 cows, um, that was per farm, so that was the herd average, and that those farms had 4.47 acres per cow, which is quite a bit higher than, than most uh, organic dairy farms. So requires more land because they're eating more forage from their own farm. And then the average reported annual milk production per cow was 9,305. All right, so we asked a bit about satisfaction, self-reported producer satisfaction around various parameters. And again, you can see this uh, full report in the publication. But we asked people if they were satisfied with their pasture, quality and yield, um, stored feed, soil fertility and health, and stored forage yields. And you can see most people um, were at least somewhat satisfied, right? So over 70% of all the people that returned um, their surveys were satisfied with their forages, were satisfied more or less with uh, the way the soil fertility and health were in their stored forage yields. All right, so then producers were also asked how they felt they were doing with other forage parameters based on a scale ranging from very low to very high. And you can see that farmers on average, you know, about usually close to 50%, right, on average were um, felt, felt good about growing higher energy forages, felt uh, really, pretty good about improving how they would improve forage quality, uh, if they understood their forage tests, different strategies that they would use to maximize forage dry matter intake. Um, and they felt like they had good knowledge on any energy requirements uh, that their cows needed. Now, interestingly, this is where we started to dig in a little bit and we've dug into a lot of the results um, trying to figure out, you know, sort of next directions for our research focus. But one of the discrepancies we saw was that um, people felt like they understood the energy requirements for their cows. So what their cows needed in terms of energy every day, but what they felt less confident about or felt like they had less knowledge on was how to grow the high energy feed. So this is just one area that we've been focused on trying to help farmers grow high energy feed so that they can meet the energy requirements of their cows. So again, just a few tidbits from our national survey and we were, you know, happy with the amount of respondents. Uh, we were surprised about so many of those respondents being from the plain community and also that most of our respondents, again, were mostly from the Midwest and the East. And again, a lot of that has to do with where most of the grass-fed dairies are located. But we also know that getting that big 50,000 uh, foot view doesn't give us all the details that we wanted. We really wanted to start digging in more 
on the details, right? So we learned a little bit about what those farms looked like, how much land they needed, how many cows they're milking, um, where they felt like they were doing well and maybe needed a little more help. And then of course, our next steps were to dig in a bit more. So from that national survey, um, we developed a benchmarking grass-fed production survey or program. And we also started to look more closely at the cost of producing grass-fed milk. So these are a much smaller subset of grass-fed dairies, primarily located in the Northeast, so that we could get a little more detailed picture about what's happening on these farms. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Ziegler, who's going to talk about the benchmarking production program. Great. Thanks, Heather. All right. So um, as Heather mentioned, um, this program was with a much smaller group of farmers um, that are, were mostly focused in the Northeast um, from mainly New York and Vermont and a few other states. Um, and there were about 20 producers overall in that group. This was started um, from a project that we worked with Cornell on starting back in 2017 that we then took over through this project and have since um, developed an online platform to be able to more easily and quickly collect and disseminate the information. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that program, how it works and some of the data coming out of it. But first, I just wanted to kind of give a broader overview of what are we talking about when we say it's a grass-fed dairy benchmarking program. So benchmarking just in general is where you're comparing your data um, against some standard. So, you know, it's utilized a lot in uh, business or financial uh, performance analysis and things like that to then be looking for identifying opportunities for improvement, right? If you uh, differ significantly from sort of the average pool of similar producers, you know, there might be an opportunity there for a change to take place so that you can gain those efficiencies. So we're trying to apply that uh, system to the grass-fed dairy um, production metrics, right? So we're talking about milk production, milk components, milk quality, management practices, and really whatever farmers, researchers, and technical service providers want to collect is what we wanted to be able to build a system to collect that data um, and then report that data back. Okay, so just a little bit about how the program works. It involves filling out a monthly survey, which sounds daunting, but it is relatively short and quick and easy, especially if you utilize our online system. You can even do it on your um, smartphone. And you can see over here on the right side, a, a picture of just sort of the beginning sections of the survey. So you have the opportunity, like I said, to participate online um, through a web-based uh, application that we had created or via mail, where I'll mail a paper survey out to a producer, they'll fill it out and mail it back. And these first sections are sort of the meat of the program that are coming right off of the milk check. So it's just, what did you sell for total pounds of milk, fat, protein, all that kind of stuff. And then because we're trying to get at not just milk sales, but milk production overall, there's a few follow-up questions about milk that goes elsewhere on the farm or leaves the farm farm, um, you know, consumed at home, fed to calves, whatnot. Um, and then there's further sections in the survey as well that collect some information on supplemental feeds being fed and amounts. Um, there's more detail around the grazing season, harvest management, um, weather conditions, and things like that. And again, really anything we wanted to collect, we could put in here. So this is sort of what we've tried to design as the basic information, the most basic information we wanna collect plus some supplemental um, contextual information to help make sense of it. So once the farmer fills out that uh, survey, if they're on the online system, this is what it looks like. They see they're immediately brought to a report that shows their responses, um, the individual responses to each question. So if there was an error, they could edit that. Um, but then also on this, on the right-hand side over here, you see there's a table up at the top and then some graphs at the bottom. And so this is the report that we're looking at is from November, 2021. So this producer um, you can see has data going all the way back to 2017 when we started the program. We have backfilled all of that data into our database so that those farms could continue to view that data. Um, and so you can see this particular farm's data is shown on the far right where it says November 2021, but then they get a snapshot of each November from previous year. So they can kind of see how they're doing over time given the same time point throughout that year. 
And then at the bottom, this is where the sort of benchmarking actually happens. Uh, these graphs, each one of these shows one of the components that showed up in the top of the table. So like the first one, for instance, up at this top here is looking at milk production in pounds per cow per day. And the blue line is showing this particular farm's data over the past few months. The green line is the average for all of the farms in the program. And then each of the little gray hash marks that you see is a data point from another farm. So each one of those dots is a farm, is a farm uh, participating in the program. So a farm looks at these graphs and can really see where they fit in that distribution, not just compared to just the average, but overall that whole range um, in responses. And so there's a bunch more graphs that you can't see on here, um, but it basically goes through each one of those production metrics. And they also have the opportunity using these filter buttons up at the, in the middle here to change the time scale. If you had many years of data, you can change that to look over a longer period of time. And then you can also change to include farms not all farms in the program, but you can limit the scope to farms in your in your particular state or in your region um, or of similar herd size, similar milking frequencies, and what have you. So you can really make sure that you are looking at the data that best reflects um, your individual farm. And so this is just a table pulling out some of the, the current benchmarks that we've derived from this program. And you can see it lines up actually pr pretty well with what we saw in the national survey. So the herd size is 55 cows per farm, milk production just under 9,000 pounds per cow per year, which is about 30 pounds a day. You can see fat and protein content, somatic cell, milk, urea, nitrogen. We also, because we were looking at um, milk for other uses, we know they're managing on average about 12 ca calves a month that they're feeding 2.3 gallons of milk to a day. Um, and again, other minerals, kelp, molasses, some folks are feeding molasses and other energy sources. We also can capture um, amounts of each of those being fed too. So again, somebody who's maybe working with a grass fed dairy farm or somebody who's interested can kind of have an idea of what, what that system sort of looks like in more detail. And then we also collect um, some annual information that's not on the monthly survey, but it's like a beginning and end of the year survey that tells us a little bit more just in general about their, their management practices. So like where they're milking, what their winter housing um, systems are. Again, we capture the milking frequencies um, there as well. And if they're like uh, managing seasonally or milking year round, so we can then use that information to filter those farms out. Um, so we're collecting all sorts of information that we can utilize and report back to farms. And one of the things that has been interesting to us since the beginning of this project has been um, the, the, the range in milk urea nitrogen and, um, on, on these grass-fed dairy farms. And you, you can see this graph is showing you milk urea nitrogen in the blue bars, and then the gray bars are somatic cell count in thousands. And so I just put this up here to just point out that this, these are averages for all of these farms that have been with us in this program since pretty much all of them since 2017. So it's a lot of data. And there are, this is showing us these opportunities um, for some farms um, and for research to try to understand what's going on here. So if we're looking at milk urea and nitrogen, I mean, this farm right here, right, is averaging over all of that time over 16, which is well outside of the range that we would consider sort of normal and ideal um, and maybe running into reproductive performance issues and other um, other challenges, um, whereas this farm over here, you know, is is running under eight. And again, generally we see uh, milk urea and nitrogen levels, you know, dipping down lower in the winter and raising over the grazing season and getting to the highest points late summer. But this farm, um, you know, when they're low must be, you know, pretty, <laughs> pretty significantly low um, for much of the year to drag that average that far down. And then similarly with um, somatic cell count, you know, again, this farm averaging close to 350,000, whereas this farm is down um, about 100,000. So again, just opportunities to, um, for education for the farmers, for technical assistance, um, and also for further research to sort of dig in and understand why some of these differences are occurring and if there's management implications that um, are leading to these. So with this benchmarking program, um, we, as I mentioned, we developed an online platform. So we sort of took it from just mail and paper, very time intensive um, system to an online system so that we can really 
we're ready to launch this nationwide and trying to get more farms participating, covering a broader geographic range than just the Northeast um, and get a, a greater representation of more management systems. So again, farms have that ability to filter out their data and really see, um, compare to as many farms as possible that are very similar to their, their production system, not just grass-fed dairy as a whole. But again, down the road, you know, we have the flexibility in what questions we ask and when we ask them through these surveys. So we could start to utilize this tool to track, you know, current issues going on on farms more or less in real time. So we had talked about, you know, pink eye outbreaks or other, other health concerns, leaf hoppers on crops or drought conditions or any of those kinds of issues that could, you know, could be questions that pop up in particular months or times of the year um, and just help give that sort of snapshot uh, of what's happening across the country. And farmers have really uh, expressed interest in sort of the peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunity that this platform could provide where maybe they could uh, you know, provide a question that they'd like to see asked of their peers and then see the data reported back to them. And because we have that flexibility to, des to design this, the surveys how we want and when we wanna ask those, you know, there's an opportunity to, to involve some more of those, um, those questions directly from the participants. And then finally, another thing that we have been thinking about and talking about is, is just the, the flexibility to integrate other data collection tools so that we would have um, both the management data to go along with some other data that would be you know, nice to pair in the same, across the same pools of farms. So for instance, the cost of production data that Sarah Flack is gonna talk about next, you know, if we were able to collect that sort of side by side with this management data, it would just provide a whole, a better picture for both those data sets um, and, and more opportunities for farmers to sort of get that information and, and learn for their, their own operations. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah Fleck, who's gonna talk about the cost of production. So this next section, I'm gonna present some of the information from the cost of production uh, part of this research project. We've got three complete years of data now for 2018, 2019, and 2020. And this first batch of information that I'm gonna go through next is uh, already published and it's uh, the um, report is available on the UVM Extension website. We're just about to begin the process or actually as of this week, <laughs> we're already collecting data from the farms in this part of the research project for their 2021 cost of production. And, um, and I wanna say the focus of this particular research really is on cost of production. We didn't look at net income or profit in this. We really wanted to stay focused on the cost since that's the piece that the farms really have some control over to try to get that information back out to them so that they could use it in their management decisions. The cost of production data analysis and collection that we've been doing is all done using Dairy Trans, which is a tool developed by Larry Trannell. And I'd like to just give him credit for letting us use it and training us on how to use it. And he also helped with some of the editing on the publication we did last fall on the initial data that we had. And this website here, Iowa State, is where you can go find more information about this particular um, Dairy Trans tool. So just a little bit about how these uh, cost of production data collection uh, visits are done and were done. They started out all being done in person on the farm. And then as the pandemic started, we shifted them over to doing them on Zoom or by some combination of phone, email, and uh, also mail, since some of the farms participating in this part of the study are from the Plain community, but we were able to continue to work effectively with them as well as the farmers that are also using computers to continue doing the data collection pretty smoothly through the whole pandemic. The farms, there is a technical assistance aspect of these visits because the farms during the cost of production calculation that we do right with them there, they get a report back on their own farm's cost of production. And then that report includes the averages now that for the first time we have a real benchmark of what all of the other farms average cost of production is. So they're able to look at their own farm, look at that benchmark and make their own management decisions um, using that information. 
We would like to increase the sample size, the number of farms participating in this part of the research project. So we are adding more grass-fed farms now as we begin, begin this 2021 data collection. A little bit of information about the farms that participated in this part of the project. They tend to be more in the Northeast. Uh, so New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. 50% of the farms in this, this group sell milk to Organic Valley, 47% sell to Maple Hill Creamery, and then 3%, and I think it's gonna be a little higher this year, are selling to other direct markets. The herd size for this group of farms is a little bit larger than some of the average herd sizes in some of the other groups in our research project. So herd size average of 62, but a range from 23 cows up to 200 cows. It's pretty similar in terms of the average number of years that they've been grass fed. So these are on average pretty experienced grass fed farms produced, participating in this, being grass fed for 4.5 years. And the majority of them had been certified organic for significantly longer than that. Looking again at the high acreage needs for these all grass fed farms, average of 336 acres per farm. And this is total acreage of the pasture and of the cropland. And when we put the data into dairy trans, we put in the productive crop acreage. So if it's pastures that are um, include some areas that are really not very productive, we don't include that acreage there. So this is a, I think a pretty accurate uh, representation of the number of acres of productive land that they were haying, cropping and grazing with all of the animals. So it comes out to an average of 5.56 acres per mature adult cow. That's total acreage to feed the whole herd, but figured out on a per cow basis with a range from 1.7 to over 11 acres per cow. And so I will also say that some of the farms in the study were purchasing a significant portion of their forages, but we also had some farms in the study group that were producing all of their own forages and even were selling a little bit of hay. So the information in this portion in the cost of production part of the study is milk sold, not milk produced. So every now and then I'll slip up and say milk production, but really what we're talking about with this data set is the milk sold because that's how it's collected in dairy trans. So the cows on these farms on average were selling, producing and selling 8,360 pounds per cow per year. So that lines up pretty close to what we're seeing from the national survey and the other groups in here because you factor in that calves are going to be drinking some of that milk. The range here is very interesting though. You see there's a range from just over 4,000 pounds of milk per cow to almost 15,000 pounds of milk per cow being sold. This next number here is the average number of hundredweights then sold from each farm each year. And that's an important number to be thinking about because when we do our cost of production calculations, we do it per hundredweight sold. And so this is the hundredweights sold per farm. Dairy Trans also does some labor efficiency calculations that are really interesting. So this is looking at full-time equivalents, FTEs, which is 3,000 hours of work per year. And these calculations are done both on the paid or hired labor and also on the unpaid labor. So on average, there were 2.37 full-time equivalent workers on the farm and each full-time equivalent worker was milking 27.6 cows. But again, there's this huge range from about 10 cows to 66 cows per full-time equivalent. You can certainly see that on average compared to a conventional dairy, this is a lot more workers per cow. Then when we look at the amount of milk sold per full-time employee, 2,625 hundredweights, but again, this enormous range in labor efficiency. So this is the three-year average cost of production. This is the information that you can get a lot more detail on in the report that's on the UVM Extension website. 
And so the average cost for all of the farms for all three years together was $43.59 per hundredweight equivalent. So that's a total of 66 farms over three years. And there is some overlap since there were quite a lot of farms that participated in all three years, but there were a few new farms that came in or dropped out each year. So I want to say a little something about the hundredweight equivalents here. Dairy Trans uh, calculates the cost of production on hundredweight equivalents, which is a little different than the actual hundredweights sold from the farm. And so the simple way of describing it is that this takes the non-milk income, things like income from sale of some extra hay or the calves, it transforms that into milk hundredweights and then it adds it back to the hundredweights. And so, for example, the hundred weights on average was 5,140 that were sold, but once it was transformed to hundred weight equivalents, it increases the hundred weights to 5,927. So that means that these farms, it's, they are factoring in all of that other income. Otherwise, the cost of production would actually be somewhat higher because it would have been divided over a smaller number of hundred weights. So that's how we get this average of 43.59 per hundred weight. So obviously we wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into figuring out how the different management systems were impacting these different costs per hundred weight. And so one of the things we did was divide the farms into low cost, medium cost and high cost. So the low cost group, you can see their total cost of production was 32.97 per hundred weight equivalent, while the high cost group was 55.42 per hundred weight. So there's a huge amount of additional detail on this data in the um, research paper where you can look at the breakdown of what those individual costs were for each of those groups. But what I'd like to do with the next couple of slides is actually present some of the data that we haven't published yet, because after collecting the data in 2018, our farmer, farmer advisory group asked us a bunch of really smart questions. And so when we went back to collect the 2019 data, we collected more detail on several things. Um, for example, trying to get a breakout of um, the amount of money spent on molasses versus minerals versus forages. Um, just a bunch of different information, also looking at butterfat content on different farms and different breeds. And uh, so this data now is just from 2019 and 2020. So, uh, but it's, it's about uh, 44 uh, farms between the two years, 22 farms on average each year. So this is looking at the total amount of milk sold per year on average, then the hundred weights sold. So you can see it's somewhat similar, 5,318 hundred weights sold on average per farm per year. But then when the adjustment is made to hundred weight equivalents to factor in that non-milk income, there's 6,185. So on average, in these two years, these farms had more hundred weight equivalents sold off the farm. Milk production per cow, fairly similar at 8,562 pounds per cow that was produced and sold. And this is just the minimum the lowest number on any one of the participating farms, and this was the highest number on any one of the participating farms. And as you recall, the herd size ranged from 23 to 200 cows. So we've got a broad range in herd sizes. So I first just wanted to take a look at the cash expense per hundred weight equivalent and just talk a little bit more about um, how Dairy Trans does the total calculations in here. The total cash expense per hundred weight for the two years of data was $26.32, but that does not include interest. And it also does not include any of the manager or owner labor. So it's just the paid, the paid employee labor. Total cash expense per cow, 2,545 and per farm 159,566. So looking in a little more detail at what goes into these cash expenses, this um, 26 or $27 a hundred weight. 
So again, interest is not in here. The top five costs that account for 48.9% of the total cash expense includes repairs, the purchase of forages, supplies, hired labor, and land rental. So those of you familiar, familiar with dairy budgeting and expenses will look at this and can think, yeah, they're using, they need a lot of land to make all of this extra forage to feed these cows, or they need to buy forage to feed all these cows since they're not feeding them grain. So these expenses in a lot of way really do make sense, especially the forages and then more land rental and some additional supplies and repairs for doing all of that cropping work on a lot of these farms. So now looking at the total cost of production for the two years, 2019 and 2020, just wanted to show you a little bit in a, a fairly simplified way how you get from the cash expenses, not including the family labor or manager labor and interest, all the way down to the total cost per hundredweight. So the 2632 was the cash expense per hundredweight equivalent. And then onto that, we need to add in some balance sheet adjustments. And these include things like prepaid expenses, accounts payable, um, change in the value of the equipment and machinery between the beginning of the year and the end of the year, and then some capital purchases minus any sales adjustments. So that's a somewhat complicated way of saying these are the, the changes in the value of some of that equipment and machinery that farms need to invest in on an annual basis to keep their farms going. Then this next thing, the 4% equity here, this is what is used instead of putting in the actual interest amount and principal amount of these loans. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. This is a way to create a much more level playing field so that farms can compare themselves to each other, even if they have very different levels of debt on their farm. So then the additional thing that gets added in here, the unpaid labor cost, $46,742. This is because in the dairy trans in the cash expenses, we don't include any pay for the farmer owner. And so what's done in dairy trans is $40,000 is added per unpaid farm owner manager. So you can see this was just over one full time owner manager being paid a total of $46,742. So again, this is it not collecting the actual family living draw. This is some assigned numbers that get put in here to create a level playing field since some of the farms that participated in the study paid themselves little or nothing and sometimes some other farms were paying themselves significantly more. So all of this added up to a total cost of production of 44.55 per hundred weight. So that's slightly higher than the average cost of production in 2018, 19, and 20, which was 43.59. So the more years I've used Dairy Trans, the more I really appreciate the way it does these standardized uh, expenses instead of using the farm's actual loan payments and actual interest payments and what they're actually paying themselves, their family living draw. This 4% equity charge instead of interest and loan payments is a great way to maintain fairness when you're comparing farms that have really different debt loads from each other because it charges the same amount whether the assets are owned or borrowed. It takes the total value of the farmland, the machinery, and the equipment. It takes a 4% of that, and that's the charge that gets assigned. So for some of the farms in the study, this is significantly less than what they're actually paying in loans and interest. For others, it's a little bit more than what they're paying. It also allows farmers to participate in the project without having to share all of their confidential information specifically about what their debts are or what their total net worth is. So um, yeah, I just wanna say that the other piece that is not included in here really is the additional principal payments that a lot of these farms are having to make. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end um, on more on this, um, the way the whole calculation is done. 
So the next three slides, um, and then I'll wrap things up. This is um, Sarah Ziegler did a lot of this work on looking at some correlations and statistics to try to find out what is the relationship between different management systems and the cost of production. And so we looked at lots and lots of different things to try to find out where do we have some statistically significant things that we can really talk about. So one is that we know that these grass-fed farms manage more land in order to meet the higher forage needs. And we did see that the cost of production increased significantly as the number of acres per cow increased. We also saw that farms that were buying in a lot of their forages, a significant portion of their forages, had a lower cost of production. And those farms buying in forages were managing less acres per cow, spending less on supplies, less on fuel, and less on repairs. And they had a higher labor earnings per hour. We also looked at the purchase of supplemental energy, specifically molasses. And molasses, the farms that were buying molasses turned out that they had significantly higher cost of production, but were not making um, significantly more milk to sell. And again, this is based on milk sales, not milk production. So we can say they were not selling more milk. They might have been making more milk, um, but more of it would have been going to the calves. So clearly this area on molasses and energy feeding, you can go back to thinking on Sarah Ziegler's slides also, we really do need to look at this some more. So then we also divided the farms into farms that were producing on, on average less than the average amount of milk and farms producing that were producing more than the average amount of milk. And we found that the farms that had higher milk production and sales were managing fewer acres per cow, had higher labor earnings per hour. And interestingly enough, they were spending more per cow in their cash expenses, but because they were shipping on average 3,602 pounds more milk, if they were getting paid on average $38.70 a hundredweight, that would have come out to be enough money to more than cover the additional cash expenses per hundred weight. So that's a huge amount of information we just threw at you guys. I just want to remind you that the um, information on a lot of this cost, cost of production um, report is on the UVM website, as is the report on the uh, survey that Heather was presenting information on earlier. And that leaves us a little bit of time for questions and um, Heather can take over now. So we had a great question early on in the webinar that had to do, and I think researchers would be involved in this one, is about um, how effective it was to send a snail mail survey or mm. an online survey. And I know you answered that um, in the chat there, Heather, but you wanna just talk about that? Cause I think a couple yeah. other people might be interested. Yeah, so, um... Based on several surveys that we have done, the, you know, at least with our audience, and I'm sure this would be different depending on who's being surveyed, but at least with our audience, having the paper survey was critical to, you know, meet the needs of the producers that we work with. Um, probably right off the bat, just thinking about the plain community not using email. So, you know, an online survey doesn't work there. So, yeah, paper here, but I think it's stakeholder by stakeholder. Yeah, you said it was good to have an online option too. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so here are some of the new questions here that you haven't answered yet. Um, do you state what percentage of farms feed kelp? Um, I know you mentioned molasses, so that was in the question, but um, did you mention kelp as well? Um, I'll say in the national survey, uh, a large number of the respondents were using energy sources and over 40% of the respondents were using energy sources year round. So they were purchasing molasses or some other approved energy source. Um, but I, we didn't ask specifically about kelp. We did ask about minerals. I don't know in the benchmarking survey if there was anything there, Sarah. 
Yeah, I showed in that slide um, the amount of kelp being fed. I don't have a number on what percentage of the per current participants are feeding that, although I could definitely pull that together. The data is a little bit um, unwieldy sometimes since it's monthly data, you know, not not basically just sorting that out by um, by each participant individually rather than getting that multiple counted if they're changing what they're doing from month to month. Um, so I just put in the amount being fed on average and not the percent, but that is something we could present in the future. Okay. Um, were there any farmers using a robotic milking system? Um, and are there any insights on reconciling robotic systems with grass fed and rotational grazing? Um, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, this is Sarah Flack. Uh, no, <laughs> there were no um, there were no farms using robotic milking systems in any of the portions of the study that I am aware of. I have worked with a bunch of farms who have been very interested in trying to see if they could hit the 150 day 60 percent dry matter intake from pasture. Uh, kind of requirement, the, the grass-fed requirement with a robot. And it is really quite challenging because you have to make significant modifications to the grazing system if you're milking with a robot because the cows need to have 24-hour continuous access between the pasture and the, the robots. Um, so what we see is that the majority of the farms that have been participating in the different parts of the study I've been directly involved with have been moving towards parlors and some sort of loose housing to improve the labor efficiency, uh, but um, we're not seeing people moving towards robots. And I don't know if Sarah or Heather, if you have anything to add to that from any farms you've worked with recently. I, I don't. Okay. Um, okay, we have a couple questions coming in about the relationship between MUN and SCC. Um, Karen noticed that it's interesting that the herd with the highest MUN had the lowest SCC. And um, Brian wanted to know if there was a correlation um, between those two. Yeah, good question. Um, so I will say we, we have also been signing up another portion of farms, another about uh, 20 farms who've been on monthly um, DHI testing and we've been gaining access to their data for a number of years now as well. Um, and so we have even more, more information there, um, getting data, you know, down to the cow specific um, production and quality number. So the, the data that was there was just self-reported um, what was coming off of the milk check each month. So, you know, I haven't run any sort of like correlations there just because it's, uh, you know, not a huge, not a huge data set. Um, and maybe not the most in-depth, but um, it is something we've been interested in digging into more. And uh, one part of this project in particular is looking at mercury and nitrogen um, throughout the grazing season and the winter, but we, have, we didn't present any of that there since it's um, sort of still in progress. Um, so I guess the short answer is, I don't know. We haven't looked at, at that from these data sets. Okay. Um, can you participate in these surveys or use tools like Dairy Trans if you're certified organic and are 100% grass fed, but not um, certified 100% grass fed? Um, <clears throat> I'm a, so I, for Dairy Trans, I believe, and I see Larry's on the call, so maybe he can. I think several people have asked about where to find it, uh, Larry, and I'm wondering if you could put that into the chat. That might be useful. As far as um, Dairy Trans goes, Larry manages that tool. Our benchmarking tool, you know, you can reach out to Sarah Ziegler, who's on the call, and, and she can talk to you more about using um, the benchmarking tool. But the, the cost of production work that we're collecting farm per farm, uh, we're in the last year of that. So at this point, we're not enrolling any new farms. And I would just add to that in general in the benchmarking program, you know, at this point, we haven't divided out. Um, we haven't asked whether they're certified versus not and divided that out. But we 
as I said, um, you know, the program is flexible. So if we had a bunch of farms trying to participate that weren't certified and we felt like it was useful to add a question to divide that to filter the farms out so that you could view the data, um, you know, by certified farms versus not certified farms, mm -hmm. we could do that as well. Okay, yeah, Larry, if you wouldn't mind putting the link to the um, dairy, to dairy Trends in the chat and then also making sure that you send it to everyone, not just the host and the panelists. That way everybody will be able to see it because we definitely have some people interested. Um, okay, let's go back up. We've got really active audience here. So um, there's a lot <clears throat> of questions coming in. Um, okay, how many farms provided usable financial data in each year? The uh, cost of production uh, part of the project, it was an average of 22 farms that um, we had uh, usable data from each year. And there were certainly more farms than that that provided data. And but it, if, if there were missing some data or there was something that they just weren't able to organize for us. There were a handful of farms where we ended up not actually using their data, but it was 22 on average that got used each year. Okay, and were any of those from Wisconsin? In the cost of production portion of the project, no, it, and that was just in the Northeast region. So it was Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, um, New York, and Pennsylvania were the four states that we had farms represented in the cost of production portion of things. Okay. Um, is there a correlation from the higher cost farms with higher or lower producing farms? Um, we did divide all of the farms in the cost of production portion of the study into farms who were shipping lower than the average pounds of milk um, per farm and higher. And we did see, as I recall, there was a correlation um, with uh, lower cost of production on farms that were shipping on average um, uh, more than average amount of milk. <laughs> okay. And we Sorry. will um, we will pull together some some of the slides to send out afterwards. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll get the slides back in just a second here. So. Um, Oh, yeah, I just found I've got my paper copy of the slides here and I'm wearing my reading glasses. So, um, yes, yeah, so the farms that were um, that had higher milk production, those were the farms that were managing fewer acres per cow um, that had higher labor earnings per hour and had the um, they had higher cash expenses per cow, but overall were making more income. Um, so those were the things that we had enough statistical significance to be able to say with confidence. We looked at a bunch of other things, um, but these were the things that we felt comfortable saying, yes, there's a correlation with this, with a higher than average amount of milk production. Okay. So um, let's see, in addition to cows per FTE, it might be interesting to see gross revenue per FTE. Yeah, I can't remember if we put that in the um, in the report that's up on the UVM website. But there is, um, I mean, I think one of the real takeaways that a lot of the farms that participated in the cost of production uh, meetings with with me and others was that a lot of them really looked at labor efficiency and made some decisions uh, like at least one of the um, farms in the project looked at labor efficiency and then promptly built themselves a milking parlor to see if they could improve the um, labor efficiency after looking at that sort of thing so yeah i think a lot of that information has been very helpful both to us in understanding things and also to the participating farmers okay and thank you larry for putting the contact information there in the chat um, okay, so in other words, without off farm income, um, are these farmers making very little profit? <laughs> so um, I, I'll just, 
I'll say we really tried to keep our focus on cost of production in this part of the study um, because we really wanted to focus on the piece that farms do have control over, which is what their costs are. And we had farms selling to multiple different milk buyers at a pretty wide range of, of pay price. Uh, and um, so I, I just encourage you to look at the report that's on the website to get a little bit more detail on all three years worth of data. I don't know if Heather, if you've got anything to add to that. No, I think, yeah. <laughs> We're focused on the cost of producing the milk. You know, people's profitability uh, depends on, on many factors outside what we were looking at, so. Okay. Um, let's see, were average costs normally distributed over the farms or were there more farms above or below average costs than below or above average? Yeah, I don't know if I have enough of the data in front of me to be able to answer that question. That sounds like one of those questions that Sarah Ziegler and I will then spend an entire hour meeting and looking at. Um, and we love questions like that because that's what helps us dive deeper into this and start asking better questions. Yeah, I was just going to add to when you showed the breakdown of those high, medium and low cost groups, those were roughly even groups, if that helps sort of answer your question a little bit. I don't have a quick one sentence description on what that distribution looks like at the moment. Okay, um, why are the repair costs so high? Well, I don't have a specific answer to that, but it did seem that farms that were um, farming more land and therefore driving more equipment around to spread manure and harvest crops, they tended to have higher repair costs. Uh, and so the, the, the majority of it on most of the farms was um, equipment and machinery repair costs. So it really is a large acreage that these farms are having to uh, graze and produce forages on. Okay, um, why do you think the cost of production was so much higher for the farms buying molasses? <laughs> we would like to know that too. Um, I see that question coming in from Ashley. Yeah, um, that is definitely an area that we would like to dig into more one of the things that we certainly have talked about as we've been looking at these data sets is there really seem to be some very um, like there's some different management systems out there that farms have and um, and wanting to look a little bit more at those management systems. I think we would need a larger data set um, so that we could look at farms within the whole data set who were either feeding molasses or not feeding molasses to be able to you know, come up with an answer with very much confidence on that one particular. I will say that over the three years so far, I see generally farms um, feeding less molasses. Uh, they kind of move away from it over time as they're able to um, focus more on the, the, the high quality forages. But I think this is an area that really warrants some more research. It's pretty fascinating. Okay, um, how does the difference in the cost of production, um, what, or actually how does, how does the cost of production compare between conventional milk systems and organic milk production? I mean, that's not exactly what you looked at here. You looked specifically at grass-fed production, but do you have any comments about that? Well, the, the very quick answer is that the grass-fed significantly higher per hundred weight than the organic cost of production, which is higher than the conventional cost of production. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that. Um, we do have another webinar coming up in March where we'll look into that a little bit more. Okay. Um, was increased milk production based upon dairy breed management or the amount fed? Um, can you ask that question again? Yeah, I think the person, uh, the Virginia here has asked the question and she was wondering um, whether um, increased milk production was based upon dairy breed, the management or the amount fit. Um, so 
I can jump in a little bit, Sarah. Yeah, you can add to it, it if Sarah. you want. Well, so one thing I was going to say in the survey from our national survey, we did see um, a correlation between higher milk production and Holsteins, um, as we'd expect. But in our other data sets, the majority of farms are using crossbreeds. And so we don't have a finer level of detail to sort of hash out more, more specifically than that, if that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, we do, we do have Holstein grass-fed herds that are making more milk um, per cow and, and lower butterfat. Um, but to go beyond that, we, we don't really have the fine grain detail there. Okay. Um, are you considering tracking fertility and soil health changes over time on these farms? Yes. <laughs> but so as, um, Heather had mentioned in some of our the other objectives of this project, you know, one of the things that we've been sort of trying to figure out what's happening with nutrient cycling on these farms related to soil fertility and health and and that sort of question of are they managing, are some farms managing a wider land base because it's less productive because they're not bringing on those nutrients that normally would be imported in grain. And so that sort of whole farm nutrient balance and nutrient cycle is different. Um, so we have been collecting some of that data um, on farms and also putting in some on-farm fertility, forage fertility um, trials to try to unpack sort of what is that return on that investment and, and thinking more long-term, you know, about what those inputs into that system are. And if, if you do need to increase your land base, sort of that, the, the cost um, versus sort of output of that. Okay. Um, how can farmers get in additional information on how to participate in the cost of production work? Should they reach out to you or you have any any particular person they should contact? If they want to participate with their, uh, so 2021 is the last year that we'll be um, collecting grass-fed cost of production as part of this, this project. Um, but um, yeah, if they would like to participate in, in that piece of it, um, they could contact either me or Sarah Ziegler um, or Heather. And I would just add that um, that the last link that you see on your screen right now that has the um, RUVM extension slash NW crop slash grass fed dairy has, that page has all the information about this project and those reports that are there and contact information as well. So if anybody has a question about either participating or, or anything that they've seen um, here or, there, or on that website, they can reach out. Okay, great. Okay, here's a question from Cheryl. She wanted to know, um, she might have missed it, but was equipment depreciation included as a cost? The depreciation is uh, factored into the balance sheet adjustments that I um, very, very briefly kind of skimmed over in that one slide, Cheryl. So it's not in the, obviously it's not in the cash expense per hundred weight, it's in the additional um, add-ons. And Larry's sending us another helpful text message that, uh, um, yeah, so Larry has sent some additional notes in the chat box. Um, on some of the dairy trans stuff that I think will be useful for people to read through too. Okay, yeah, and we had a question about that and I think that might've been what Larry was answering. Tom here at, um, asked, um, as you add farms from the Midwest, um, it would um, realize that in general, the cost of production tends to be lower versus the Northeast. And that's true when comparing conventional um, with conventional grazing versus grazing, et cetera. And so, um, Let's see, Larry said that on the average in the Midwest, organic is often 12 to $15 higher per hundredweight than conventional with grass milk. Okay, so I'm not gonna read everything that he wrote there, but um, you can take a look at the discussion here in the chat. Okay, um, were you collecting other data on nutritional components in the milk, in particular the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids? I know there was a webinar last year that mentioned some of that. So if you take a look in our archive, um, you can find that too. Yeah, and on the in the benchmarking program, um, because the, the information is meant to just sort of be quickly 
jotted down off of the milk check. We don't have that kind of level of detail. It's self-reported data that the farmer would need access to. We're not actually like collecting samples and processing them. So um, unless farms have that information readily available, um, you know, we're not we're not really collecting that information at this time. But I it, it definitely is an area of interest for sure. Okay. Um, when looking at production versus cost control, do you have a feeling as to which is more important in improving farms' economic outlook? That's a great question um, in terms of should they be increasing milk production or should they be focusing on, on uh, lowering um, cash expenses? Um, I would say for a lot of these farms, it's probably both. Um, but um, yeah, I don't. I think I think we'll really need to dig into this a little bit more to get a be better sense of that. Okay, are these all seasonal dairies or are some year round? So the majority of these farms are milking year round. There are a certain percentage of them who are fully seasonal, where the cows are dry for a, a couple of months. The whole herd is dry at once for a couple of months. Um, there are also some farms participating in this who use alternative milking schedules other than seasonal milking. Some of them will milk uh, once a day at certain times of the year or year round. Um, so they're, uh, they're mixed in, but it's just a, a percentage of the overall farms participating in the project. Most of them are um, more conventional year-round milking and year-round calving. And I'll just add to that, that we we are looking at dividing that group out and sort of um, digging into those different management systems a little bit more. So you can keep checking our website for more information as that as we work through that data. Okay. Um, was any grain fed to young calves in these dairies? Grain feeding is not allowed um, under the grass-fed certification standards. And so, no, the um, these are um, only forage and mineral supplementations. Um, a small amount of energy is allowed in the grass-fed standards. Uh, generally, that's uh, either a liquid or a dry molasses. Um, but no grain or gra grain byproducts are allowed under the grass-fed standards that all these farms are meeting. Okay. And... Um Okay, Ellis um, asked, um, she sees that the cost of production was 44 and the average milk price was 38.50. How can that be sustainable? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would encourage you to take a look at the, the range um, as well as the average to try to um, get a little bit of um, more information on how we started to try to address that question. And so I didn't present all of the data where we broke the farms into the uh, low cost, medium cost, and high cost groups and looked at their cost of production um, and each of their different expenses separately. Uh, but that's certainly one of the ways that we started to try to answer that question that you have, because um, it really is a good question. Is ultimately, we would like this data to help the, the farmers and the companies buying the milk be able to provide technical assistance to the farmers so that they can have a cost of production which works with the pay price that they're able to get. Okay, we have time for one more question here. Um, can you talk a bit about the percentage of tie stall dairies, how that relates to the cost of production, and how to reconcile the welfare issues with tie stall and potential future regulations around tie stalls? We didn't actually run any correlations between the housing systems and the milking systems um, with cost of production that I recall. Um, Sarah, I don't, unless you can think of any data sets that we looked at that actually looked at that. No, I don't believe with the cost of production we did. Um, we have that data for our benchmarking program. So we know what percentage of those farms are um, using different milking or housing systems, but not in the cost of production data. Okay, well, thanks everyone for all of those great questions and for your active participation here. Um, I am uh, really looking forward to the next webinars in this series. And if you'd like to join us, um, you can just Google webinars by eOrganic and you'll see a um, schedule of all of our upcoming webinars so far this spring.